but in 1892 the demands became irresistible, and I went to London where I delivered a lecture before the Institution of Electrical Engineers. It had been my intention to leave immediately for Paris in compliance with a similar obligation, but Sir James Dewar insisted on my appearing before the Royal Institution. I was a man of firm resolve, but succumbed easily to the forceful arguments of the great Scotsman. He pushed me into a chair and poured out half a glass of a wonderful brown fluid, which sparkled in all sorts of iridescent colors and tasted like nectar. Now, said he, you are sitting in Faraday's chair, and you are enjoying whiskey he used to drink. In both aspects it was an enviable experience. The next evening I gave a demonstration before that institution, at the termination of which Lord Rayleigh addressed the audience, and his generous words gave me the first start in these endeavors. I fled from London and later from Paris to escape favors showered upon me, and journeyed to my home where I passed through a most painful ordeal and illness. Upon regaining my health I began to formulate plans for the resumption of work in America. Up to that time I never realized that I possessed any particular gift or discovery, but Lord Rayleigh, whom I always considered as an ideal man of science, had said so, and if that was the case I felt that I should concentrate on some big idea. One day, as I was roaming in the mountains, I sought shelter from an approaching storm the sky became overhung with heavy clouds but somehow the rain was delayed until all of a sudden there was a lightning flash and a few moments after a deluge this observation set me thinking it was manifest that the two phenomena were closely related as cause and effect and a little reflection led me to the conclusion that the electrical energy involved in the precipitation of the water was inconsiderable considerable the function of lightning being much like that of a sensitive trigger here was a stupendous possibility of achievement. If we could produce electric effects of the required quality, this whole planet and the conditions of existence on it could be transformed. The sun raises the water of the oceans and winds drive it to distant regions where it remains in a state of most delicate balance. If it were in our power to upset it when and wherever desired, this mighty life-sustaining stream could be at will controlled. We could irrigate arid deserts, create lakes and rivers, and provide motive power in unlimited amounts. This would be the most efficient way of harnessing the sun to the uses of man. The consummation depended on our ability to develop electric forces of the order of those in nature. It seemed a hopeless undertaking, but I made up my mind to try it, and immediately on my return to the United States, in the summer of 1892, work was begun, which was to me all the more attractive, because a means of the same kind was necessary for the successful transmission of energy without wires. The first gratifying result was obtained in the spring of the succeeding year when I reached tensions of about 1,000 volts with my conical coil. That was not much in the light of the present art, but it was then considered a feat. Steady progress was made until the destruction of my laboratory by fire in 1895, as may be judged from an article by T.C. Martin, which appeared in the April number of the Century magazine. This calamity 